basis, which is what do you do when you're card dead against calling stations? A lot of people think there's overly simplistic answers to this. A lot of people think that there is some way you can control your destiny at the poker table and that you can always win if you just play your cards right. But, um, not necessarily true. See all of you already trickling in from the Poker Coaching Study Session. Shout out to Real JPB for getting first place in the $200 tournament for $60,000. Good job, good work. Good job, good work. See all the regulars here, plus a few other people. We have Van People, Scott, Greg. From the Poker Coaching Study Session, I presume maybe Louis Philippe. Good morning, good morning. We see Dean. Hello, hello. All right, here's a question from a poker coaching member. I often find that I go card dead in tournaments. In small stakes games where people are calling stations, what can you do? When you see lots of flops and always miss, you get blinded down. What are you supposed to do? As you see, this is a question that, <laughs> based on uh, the fact that it was asked, what can I do twice? Uh, this is something that frustrates a lot of people because in reality, what's going to happen is when you go to play poker, sometimes you're just not going to get good cards. It happens. And when you don't get good cards, hate to break it to you, you're probably going to lose. Simple as that. You're probably going to lose when you get bad cards. You're probably going to lose when you miss every flop. You're probably going to lose when all of your bluffs get called. You're probably going to lose when all your value bets don't get called, right? Whenever things go poorly, as they will in any game that has a lot of variance, you're probably going to lose, okay? Understand it, accept it, realize it. Hey, I just went live. I did just go live, well, two minutes ago. I've actually been awake since about 5 a.m. because of children, you know, so we have to have our brain fuel. Got to have our brain fuel to get up and get going. You voted for me for the GPI Personality of the Year Award. I appreciate it. If you've enjoyed my show here on YouTube, if you enjoy my content, if you enjoy my training site, if you enjoy the books, if you enjoy all the stuff I do, I would appreciate it if you throw me a vote. We're down to the final four people. Funny enough, we are down to four big YouTubers. Turns out, YouTube is a great way to make connection with other people. I think a lot of people um, don't really comprehend how you can develop a following and develop an audience by getting on here and talking to a camera. But you got to realize that you can make like real connections way better than you can on any other platform, I think. And not shockingly, all four people up for the top four in the uh, GPI Poker Personality of the Year Award are pretty big YouTubers. So thanks to YouTube for making this happen. I appreciate it. You've not heard of the other three. Well, you wouldn't. Well, one of them, uh, Greg Goes All In, is a popular YouTuber. The other two YouTubers are um, very big ones in um, in France. He uh, makes his content in French. And the other one makes his content in Japanese. So you would not know them because you're never shown them on the YouTube algorithm, funny enough. Which is kind of neat to think about. There's people out there. Um, the, the guy from Japan actually has... 600,000 subscribers. It's a lot, of, a lot of YouTube subscribers who enjoy his content in Japanese. So good job to him for building up his channel. Interestingly enough, a lot, I mean, a lot of the people don't realize that the way you make like a good thriving community is just by like getting out there and helping people on a regular basis. And all, all the people in the Final Four do that. They make a point to build up others, improve others' lives, entertain them. And, um, you know, that, that's great. I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see that they are all getting the attention that I think they deserve. So anyway, do I deserve to win? I don't know. <laughs> if you think I do, though, head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote and vote. I'd appreciate it. All right. Sometimes you're going to go card dead. Such is life. So a big assumption that the person who asked me this question made is that my opponents are calling stations. But are they really? Are they really calling stations? So many people make this blanket assumption about the opponents and I personally think it's a very big mistake because at least in my experience and especially when I'm playing in you know medium and high stakes tournaments against the non-professional players is that they really don't want to put all their money in without a good hand they'll put in some of their money they'll splash around a lot pre-flopping on the flop but if you make them 
put all their money in, especially early in a tournament, or whenever there's no re-entry period anymore, they're just not going to call unless they have a pretty good hand. So you should consider triple barreling and using large sizes, especially when the board is scary for their perceived range and when you have relevant blockers to whatever the nuts is. So say the river brings the third spade, right? Whatever, whatever it is. Say the river brings the third spade or four to a straight or something like that. You can put in a big bet. And if your opponent doesn't have literally a flush or maybe a set or a straight, right? They're going to end up folding a lot of the time. And what a lot of people do wrong, the results in them losing when they just don't connect with the board, is that they never bluff because they think their opponents are always going to call, but they don't. Also, a lot of people will make the error of like betting the flop and betting the turn using medium sizes, get to the river, and then just check every time they don't have anything without realizing that a lot of the players in the small six games are calling stations pre-flop and on the flop and on the turn because they want to get to the river to see if they have anything. So the error a lot of people make against these players is they let them get to the river with a wide range and then they don't bluff them, which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. If anything, if you know your opponent has a wide range on the river, you should be bluffing very frequently. Now, if your opponent is going to call your river bet on the four straight board with bottom pair every time, life becomes very easy for you because now you just value bet very thin, right? It's very nice whenever you know your opponent's going to call with like a literal error on the river because then you can value bet middle pair and you don't have to worry about it. You just know you're going to get called by a whole lot of worse stuff. Uh, you can also, against a lot of the very weak players, use various bet sizes that will often result in them doing what you want them to do. Because a lot of people who are going to call the river with bottom pair on a four straight board or a, a three flush board, they're not going to all of a sudden start raising if you bet 25% pot on the river. They're going to say, oh, all right, 25% pot. I got my bottom pair. I call, which is great. And that way you get value from your top pair, no kicker or middle pairs on scary boards against these players. And you also don't lose a ton whenever they do happen to raise you, assuming they're not overly aggressive and Again, most people in small six games are not overly aggressive, especially on the river. <sighs> Peter, I'm not sure what you're saying. John says, there are some players in your area, Atlantic City, that call your triple barrels for large sizes on good boards. They call with nothing. So your advice is to stop bluffing fish. Sure. Again, if your opponents will call the river with a side on any board, yeah, stop bluffing. But it's not just stop bluffing, it's value bet thinner, right? Calling stations are usually passive. I completely agree with Paulo here. A lot of people think that their opponents who are active are going to be aggressive, but that is not true, right? And as Paulo says here, anytime they show any type of aggression, you should usually get out of the way. And I completely agree with this. Most people in small six games, I'm telling you, I have loads of experience teaching my students how to crush these games. And I've had great experience crushing the small six games. The, the players will play very loose preflop, very loose on the flop, pretty loose on the turn, and overly tight on the river. Not aggressive on any betting round. And, you know, you get after it. You get after it and you bluff them on the river. Now, again, like I said, if they were going to call with every, every ace high and every bottom pair, obviously just start value betting very thin. Life is easy when your opponents play in a very predictable manner. But, you know, that does imply that you need to get a middle pair or better. <laughs> sometimes you will go to the casino and you will play and you will not get middle pair or better at all. And you're probably going to lose. But whenever you do get middle pair and better, as you often will, you'll end up winning a ton of money against these players. And you got to realize that the way, if you win or lose on a specific day or a specific session or a specific month even, does not necessarily matter when you're playing high variance games. So... You have to wrap your mind around the idea that some days when you go to the casino or play your online poker sessions, whatever, you're just going to lose. And that is okay. It is okay to lose. So many people wrap their mind around the idea, or they, they, they're wrapped up in the idea of if I don't win money in some short period of time, I must be a loser at poker. And if I'm a loser at poker, it's all I have. Therefore, I must be a loser at life. And it's just not true. I mean, as a simple example of this, imagine, let's just imagine. Let's imagine you're going to, let me get on calculator. Let's imagine when you go to the casino, you know you're going to lose $1,000 80% of the time. Okay? That means 80% of the time, you lose $1,000. Maybe we need to get out a notepad. Notepad may be better for this. 
thousand dollars minus thousand times 0 0.8 plus 20 percent of the time you are going to win let's say ten thousand dollars this is like a tournament clearly is this fine for you is this fine for you is this equation fine for you well minus a thousand this is your loss times 0.8 equals that's negative eight hundred dollars but then we have ten thousand dollars times 0.2 which is two thousand plus two thousand equals twelve hundred dollars on average here's a very very uh easy example of where you're losing 80 percent of the time but you're still winning twelve hundred dollars per session this is how a lot of the best players in the world have big win rates in small and medium stakes tournaments because yeah they're often going to lose but when they do win they often make deep runs and they take first, second, or third way more often than their opponents. And that's going to result in them winning a ton of money, even though they're usually, usually going to lose a tournament, right? It is okay to have losing sessions, especially if you're playing, you know, not very many hands. You got to realize, when you go to play a poker tournament, how many relevant hands do you actually play? Imagine you're going to go play a poker tournament, one big poker tournament in a day, which, you know, is what most people do. And you may only play, what, five or ten really relevant hands? You're like 55% on all those hands, you're going to lose all of them some portion of the time. And to win a tournament, you have to win almost all of them. So realize that sometimes you're going to lose. And also realize that a lot of players who you think may be calling stations are calling stations because you are playing poorly. Okay? You have to put a lot of pressure on your opponents who are kind of calling station E in order to get them to start making folds. But once you make them put in their entire stack or a lot of their stack, they will start overfolding. And if they don't, like I said, you'll figure that out real quick and you'll adjust. Joel says, big scores make up big losses. Make up for big losses, true. It's difficult to try to explain this to your girlfriend, LOL. Um, this is a difficult thing to explain to most people. Most people are used to the idea of they're going to go to work and they're going to get paid some money. Makes sense, right? But that is not how poker works at all. When you go to play poker, you're usually going to win a bunch or you're going to lose a bunch. But... If your wins make up for the losses, plus some, you win at the end of the day. I mean, back when I used to go play live cash games at Bellagio, I would win about half the time and I would lose about half the time, which, you know, is actually kind of high variance for cash games. But whenever I won, my wins were usually about two times the size of my losses. So, I mean, I'll tell you, back in the day, I would either, like on average, whenever I would win, it'd be something like 6,000 bucks. When I lose, it'd be something like 3,000 bucks, right? You can do the math if we do that whatever, 30 times a, uh, in a month, we're, we're making tons of money, right? Keep looking at this re-entry tournament, and you see people firing five or six bullets, LOL. Well, you got to realize, whenever you are looking at a re-entry tournament, that's just a, a tournament, right? Every tournament is an individual event. And uh, the fact that they're playing multiple bullets in that tournament does not really matter. It's like they played five tournaments, and they lost five tournaments in a row. Have you ever lost five tournaments in a row? I've lost five tournaments in a row plenty of times. So um, you, you don't need to be looking at, again, a lot of people just don't understand these concepts of every entry you put into a tournament is an individual tournament. Now, if you're buying in later, it's a tournament that has a worse structure because you're buying in halfway through the tournament, you miss all the early levels. So your return on investment's inevitably going to be a little bit lower, but just one more tournament, right? I mean, that that's, that's how math works. Simple as that. Five or six bullets, wow. <laughs> but again, it's just an individual tournament. I'm trying to think how many uh, how many tournaments I've lost in a row. I think like 40 is the most I've ever lost in a row. Could you imagine firing 40 bullets in a tournament and not getting a cash? Turns out, if you play enough, it'll happen to you too. You may think it can't, but it will. A long time ago, a guy named Iry Guy on a poker forum made an influential post for me and probably a lot of other people that essentially said, if you play long enough, you will ex... Well, what, what was it? Let me get my, my, my thoughts together. I'm trying to wing it here. Whenever you wing stuff, inevitably you get it wrong. Um, something along the lines of, at all, as time moves forward, you will eventually run worse than you ever thought possible. And it will continue happening over and over and over again. Which makes sense, right? Typically, you think, all right, I'm on a big downswing. I'm down 10 tournaments in a row. Unbelievable. Then you lose like 15. You're like, oh my God, that's worse than I thought I could possibly run. I already lost, I lost 10 in a row before, and now I'm losing 15. Then eventually you're going to get to 40. And you know, I would not be shocked that if I keep playing poker long term, especially in tough high stakes games, that I will probably lose 50 in a row. <laughs> 
And it will be unfortunate. I mean, hey, this summer the World Series of Poker, I didn't do especially well, and I bubbled three big tournaments. <laughs> Very annoying to bubble three big tournaments out of like the, whatever, 10 or 12 that I played, right? But it's well within reason. And you have to realize this. You have to understand and accept that. Um, and cash games usually won't have quite as much variance, especially if you're playing No Limit Hold'em. If you're playing games like Pot Limit Omaha, you'll go on big swings because you're getting it in roughly flipping a lot. But in live cash games especially, you probably won't have that big of down swings. I think my biggest downswing in live cash games was like, not a lot. I've been, I've been pretty lucky in live cash games. I guess like 15 buy-ins, give or take, which is not bad at all. <laughs> I would definitely sign for that. I've had way bigger swings in tournaments, but to be fair, I've probably played more tournaments compared to cash games in general. But even then, I'm thinking whenever I had those bad that bad downswing of like 15 buy-ins, I was playing like all day, every day of Lagio. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Realize though that you will run worse than you think possible at some point in the future, and that is okay. So you see people firing five or six bullets. Unbelievable. I've lost 40 in a row. Every other good pro I know has lost a lot in a row, especially if they're playing in relatively tough games, right? Is it a positive strategy to fire six bullets? It doesn't, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. Every time you buy into a poker tournament, whether it's your first entry, late entry, re-entry, whatever, you always have to view it as an individual entry. So, the question is not, I bought in four times, should I buy in again? The question is, would I buy into a tournament that was starting right now with this exact structure? And that's it. Now, you may, as Peter says here in the chat, it does depend on your bankroll, right? Imagine you were bankrolled for $1,000 tournaments, but then you lose six buy-ins, and now you're only bankrolled for $700 tournaments because you're already taking a little bit of a shot. Maybe you're bankrolled for $500 tournaments now because you were taking a little bit of a shot. Maybe it doesn't make sense then. But assuming you're properly bankrolled, and assuming you're not efficient on tilt, then, uh, yeah, why would you not play again? Right? You have to realize that as you buy in later and later, usually your return on investment is going to be smaller. So you will definitely need a bigger bankroll to play as your perceived return on investment gets smaller. But um, it, it doesn't matter. The fact that it's one tournament does not matter because every entry you, make, you put in is an entry. There's um, one tracking site out there that looks at how often people cash and they do not count re-entries, which is clearly dumb, right? They're like, oh man, look at this player. He's cashed almost every tournament he's played this year without realizing he's played seven tournaments, but he's bought in 50 times, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I got to get a good laugh in. All right. Even in loose games, you will have solid pre-flop three-bet bluffing spots. Now, what a lot of people do wrong is whenever somebody raises, when they re-raise, the re-raise is too small. When somebody raises three big blinds, you'll make it nine and then be shocked that they call you. If you have a very tight image because you've been card dead, which is what we're talking about today, how to, well, what, well, what you can do whenever you are card dead against calling stations, you will still have decent pre-flop bluffing spots. Now, you may say my opponents call me literally every time I threw you at pre-flop. Fine. But will they call you if you bet the flop, bet the turn, and jam the river? Or bet the flop and jam the turn? Probably not. Yeah, they'll see the flop every time, but they're going to miss the flop the majority of the time, which just means they're going to give you that nine big blinds pre-flop, which is fine. Right? A very good spot to do this is whenever there's a raise and a bunch of callers, you can put in a squeeze play, which is where you three bet over the raise and the callers. Typically in that scenario, you're going to want to raise to roughly the size of the pot. So, so imagine someone raises three big blinds, somebody calls, somebody calls. So a raise of two callers. The way you figure out the size of the pot, I'll type it right here, 3x the last bet plus any, any additional money in the pot. So we'd have 3x the last bet, which is the three big blind caller, plus any additional money in the pot, which would be the initial raise, the call, small blind, big blind ante. So that would be 3, 6, 7.5, 7, uh, 8.5, right? Let's do it real slowly. Initial raise, caller, small blind, big blind, ante, equals. So what is this? This is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17.5. So if there's a raise, if there's a raise and a call and a call for three big blinds, if you're going to re-raise, you want to make it 17 and a half big blinds. You know what most people do there? They make it 10 or 11, 
And then they say, why? They always call me. Well, yeah, obviously, because you price them in. Whenever you re-raise small, you force your opponents to stay in the pot. Some very good hands to squeeze in these spots are hands that contain blockers to your opponent's continuing range. This is going to usually be a hand containing an ace, ideally with some other big card, like an ace and a 10, or an ace and a 9, or a king and a 10, something like that. Hands that are not great to call with multi-way. If it goes raise, call, 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 by the way, and you have the ace-nine offsuit, you probably shouldn't call it. You should probably squeeze it or fold. And um, then if you get a caller, you can often get away with triple barreling because your opponent is going to naturally put you on a good hand because you haven't played very many hands. You've been card dead, right? And so now you get to do a lot of triple barrel bluffing or you know bluffing all in by the turn. And that's going to put your opponent in a tough spot because they are going to presume you have aces or kings or queens. You feel like a 17.5 big blind raise when you're sitting on 60 big blinds is such a big commitment. Yeah, it is, but you got to realize this is how you exploit your opponents. You're going to make a gigantic amount of money doing this on average. Say you do make it 17. Actually, if you were playing 60 big blinds, maybe you want to go a little bit smaller. As more of your stack is at risk, you typically want to go a little bit smaller. So what you could do, you can make it, let's say, 15. Say one player calls, pot's 30. You have 45 left on the flop. Bet like 10, maybe even like 7. Then on the turn, bet something like 10 on the turn. And then on the river, jam the last 30-something. That's going to give you good fold equity on the river, right? Alternatively, you could bet something like 10 on the flop and then just jam the turn, and that's going to give you a lot of fold equity on the turn. You want to make sure, what, however you play the hand, you give yourself a lot of fold equity at multiple points. So when you go 17 and a half preflop, you're giving yourself a lot of fold equity because most people aren't going to call 17 big blinds or 15, 14 more out of their 60 big blind stack with 10 eight suited. And if they are, they're just going to miss the flop a ton and you're going to crush them, right? Oh, lots and lots of questions here. When do I recommend you play? I recommend you play when the games are softest. You're starting to get bored playing smaller stakes games. Eh, you got to ask them, why are you playing? So many people play poker not to make money. And there's nothing wrong with playing poker to not make money. But you got to realize if your goal is to win money... Uh, you got to realize that ho hopefully making a decent living is enticing enough. You know, a lot of people, it's going to sound bad, a lot of people are spoiled. They think that being a professional poker player is um, a really, really hard thing to do. Hey, to break it to you. Um, you'd rather be a professional poker player than most other things, assuming you have an edge, right? Don't be entitled. A lot of people are entitled. They think that they're supposed to get everything easy and they're supposed to have a good, engaging time all the time. They think they're not never supposed to go card dead, you know? It's like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not, you're going to get bored sometimes. So you can do some things to change it up, but you have to realize whenever you change it up, oftentimes that's going to decrease the amount of money you make. I mean, whenever I used to play at Bellagio every day, I'd play 12 hours a day, 30 days a month. Yeah, I got bored sometimes. Who cares? You know, <laughs> it's like, whatever. My goal was to make a lot of money. So I was going there and I was making thirty or $40,000 a month. What's the problem? I don't see a problem with this. Um, whenever I used to play sit and goes, I play sit and goes 12 hours a day, every day. I did that for three years straight. No off days. I would take half a day off for Christmas and that was it. Made a bunch of money. That was the goal, right? Um, it's probably not the most ideal thing for like life balance, et cetera. But I realized at that point in time, all right, I'm going to give up on life balance a little bit in exchange for getting a hold of a lot of money while the games are amazingly good. And like right now, live cash games, I think is a pretty similar spot. Now, you may not be properly bankrolled to play bigger because like you said, you uh, paid off your school and maybe that took all of your money. Maybe that was an error, to be fair, because if you, you got to realize your bankroll is a tool. You can't just be giving away the tool. And, you know, that, that could have been an issue. Who knows? Is there anybody here from, oh yeah, there are people here from Twitch today. Anyway, I, I would recommend, I mean, look, you, you need to be motivated you need to find a way to care, right? But at the same time, at least in my experience, whenever I'm overly excited or I care a lot, I will inevitably make errors. I mean, you'll see this happen all the time. And whenever you're playing as a recreational player, they get pocket aces and they get excited. Like, whoo, whoo, I got my aces, let's go. And then they like don't even see somebody raise in front of them or they, they mess up with their raise size or they fumble their chips all over the table, right? It's... Because they care too much, right? You want to make sure that you're very, very sane. What blinds was I playing? I was playing 5-10 and 10-20 no limit at Bellagio. Probably 70% of the time, 5-10. 10% of the time, 10-20 when the games were softer. Games weren't too tough, but 
510 was much softer compared to 1020. Probably had roughly the same win rate in both games. Maybe slightly higher in 1020, but not worth the variance. Okay. Also, consider using larger array sizes. For example, say it folds around to the guy on the button. Super loose, flashy player. You're in the small blind. They raise to three. You make it 15. You really think they're going to call with the king seven offsuit? What do you think? Probably not. Andrew's here. Good morning. Support the channel. Smash the like button. Yeah. I'd appreciate if you click the like button. It costs you nothing. It gives me a little bit of, uh, what, credibility? It gives me something. <laughs> Who knows? Let's the YouTube overlords know you enjoy the show. If you enjoy the show, let me know. You know, I'm going to tell you all a little problem we may have with the show. This is the least popular thing I do on YouTube. But it's the thing I enjoy doing the most on YouTube. And um, my analytics overlords are telling me, you either got to get the analytics up or we're going to have to cancel this show. So if you enjoy this show, seriously, you better click the like button. Because otherwise, uh, this show may be going away. Oh, goodness. It's tough. It's tough. They're telling me to move it to a different channel, which will obviously kill it. They're telling to telling me to make it shorter. They're telling me to do it once a month instead of once a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, you know, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. As Mark says here, if they do call the uh, big re-raise with trash, you can obviously adjust and just value bet uh, wider. Correct. Value bet wider. That's something else a lot of people do not do. A lot of people... Just only three bet the nuts is what it amounts to because they're, they, they want to have a gigantic edge. But you have to be happy with a non-gigantic edge, right? I mean, imagine you knew you could just play for all of your money with 54% equity over and over. You would. You should, at least. But a lot of people won't. They want to have aces. <laughs> they want to have their opponents in very, 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 very bad shape. But you need to be happy with just having a little bit of an edge, right? If a loose, aggressive lunat maniac raises and you're sitting there with the ace-10 offsuit, you should be very happy three-betting. Which one of my books is good? Alternative to the Cash Game Masterclass. Uh, check out Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Check out that. Does preflop raise sizing matter that much? answering a question here, I'm paraphrasing. It, it really does not matter all that much. You just need to make sure you use proper ranges, right? All right. There's another assumption that a lot of people have, and that is that getting short stacked is really, 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 really bad. They never want to get short because they think when they get short, they lose most of the time. And while that is true, it's not the end of the day because, to be fair, all you really do need is a chip and a chair. While having a big chip stack is nice, if you know how to play short stacked well while everyone else is deep, you will have a gigantic edge. A gigantic edge. Um, a good example of this is a game like Raz. You all know what Raz is? This is a classic example some people, some of the old old players use. Raz is deuce of seven, uh, seven card stud. Or is it ace to five? I don't even know. Ace to five. Whatever. If you have one ante left, one ante, you put in your ante, you get your cards, and you're going to play your hand against the best hand out there, most likely, because the best hand is going to raise, everyone's going to fold, or the best hand is going to raise, everyone's gonna, one person's going to call, etc. But you're getting eight to one on your money. Seven to one on your money, six to one, however many players are at the table, right? And your random garbage hand is going to win more than 20% of the time against your opponent's good hand, Right? And that's very, very valuable. And this concept can be extrapolated on a little bit to other games. I mean, consider what happens when you have one big blind and everybody else has 100. Right? I mean, imagine there's an ante in play, and you're on the button with one big blind. And there's a you know, big blind ante. You've already paid your ante. Now, you get to put in one big blind whenever you feel like it to try to win the small blind, the big blind, the ante. So you're already getting, what, two and a half to one on your money. Plus, if somebody raises, now you're getting one big blind from them. So you're putting in one big blind to try to win a total of, what, four and a half, right? Hard to not be good 18% of the time. It's hard to not be good 18% of the time. So you can't really screw up all that bad, which is great. It means you're making a gigantic amount of profit in this scenario, right? 
realize that quite often someone's going to raise, you call, maybe somebody else calls, maybe they don't. Most people fall by the river and you take your random hand against, you know, the best hand among the table. But at the same time, you're still going to have more than 18% equity, especially before the flop, right? Also, 20 to 30 big blinds deep. You're going to have great spot. Did I say 20 to 30? 12 to 30 big blinds. You're going to have great spots to shove over raises. Anytime someone in late position raises and you have a very tight image and they are on the looser side, so they're already playing kind of loose ranges to begin with because they're in late position and they're loose to begin with, say the button's normally supposed to raise, I don't know, 50% of the hands, they're going to raise 70% of the hands. This is a great spot for you to shove incredibly wide, especially with hands that either have decent equity when called, like, um, you know, 10-8 suited, or hands with a blocker, like um, ace-nine offsuit. Those are very, very good hands to jam in that spot because you're going to end up getting a ton of folds, which is going to result in their initial raise and the small blind and the big blind of the ante going into your stack, and you're going to slowly chip up, right? Um, also, say everybody's playing 100 big blinds deep and you have, like, 20... 100 big blinds deep, hands like 7-6 suited are great. You should be raising them a lot of the time. But 20 big blinds deep or 10 big blinds deep, you should not. So your opponents playing 100 big blinds deep to some extent have to ignore you because you're not their main concern. They're trying to play 100 big blinds deep with everybody else. And if they happen to lose some money, do you, such as life, right? So if these players are opening stuff like 7-6 suited, you can jam very wide because they're going to end up folding out a lot of the time. So the idea that whenever I get short stack, I'm just doomed is certainly not ideal. Most people do not play a short stack well because they've not studied a lot. And they also have not studied how to play a 20 big blind stack against a lot of other people who are playing deeper stacked, right? And that is a problem. You have to make sure you study. Hi, you're very handsome. Oh, I know. Thank you. Peter says, you decided to join poker coaching because of this show. Well, I appreciate it. I'll probably keep doing this show. I'm telling you, though, every other video gets uh, 10,000 plus views. This one gets 4,000. Starts to drag down the YouTube analytic machine. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. I hate that idea. I hate the idea of trying to appease an analytic machine. But such is life. Is this live? Uh, you're probably seeing it on about a two-second delay, give or take. If you were three-betting pre-flop and then seeing post-flop aggression leading into you on a dry board... Is it more likely a maniac bluff or a wider range than expected? I don't know, Johnny. This is not a great question. If, if your opponent bets, do they have a good hand? I don't know, man. Depends on the spot, right? Depends on your, your opponent. Depends on the scenario. A lot of a lot of things in poker are not as clear-cut as... Do they have it or do they not? Because you don't know, especially in a random hypothetical question. Most people don't know what brain fuel is. Perhaps, perhaps. I will say when it was called a little coffee... It had an equal number of viewers. People know what coffee is. Maybe we just don't need to have a name for the show. Ooh, that's a good idea. Where's my pen and paper? Write that down. No name for the show. It's a thought. It's a thought. It does poorly because it's too early. Could be true. Could be true. All the other shows are not live, though, to be fair. A lot of them are pre-recorded, so people just watch them, whatever. We have a plane explained with Brad Wilson tonight. Five o'clock. Awesome. Get in there on, for poker coaching members. Mike says, you only lost your house so far. Good. That's not so bad. <laughs> is it okay to call and raise or is call the action? I have no clue what you're saying. Are you saying like, is it okay to play poker like they do in movies from the 1920s? I call, I see your, your bet and raise you 44. No, you cannot see and then raise it. You either call or you raise you make one action you do not make multiple actions you're allowed to take one action in this game do you use personal money for poker travel food or is your bankroll used for that i mean if you're a professional your bankroll is used for that clearly any any money you spend to play poker should come out of your bankroll in theory a little jonathan may be a better name get it ha 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 okay so anyway when you do happen to get short stacked, realize it's not the end of the world. It is A-OK. -okay. And you just have to make sure you continue playing great. Fortunately for you, we have charts and the poker coaching app. Make sure you check it out. 
you just woke up and found that Jay Little is live. Monday mornings, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. I am here for all of you. Telling you the facts. You're going to bust most poker tournaments you play, and you're going to lose some number of cash game sessions you play as well. Hate to break it to you. Hate to break it to you. So, accept it and be happy. This is a rough estimation, but I would guess I lose something like 30% of tournaments I play without winning many hands at all. It's no fun. Imagine you lose 30% of the tournaments without really getting a hold of any chips whatsoever. What if you go and you play 10 tournaments and you're just on a bad run? You could easily lose seven or eight of those tournaments without getting anything going, right? And then sometimes when you do get something going, you're still going to lose, right? And you have to recognize that that is okay. I was talking to uh, poker coach and coach Jonathan Jaffe recently at um, one of those poker go tournament series, the high, high roller tournaments they do there. And uh, I don't even know how we were talking about this. He's like, right? like, yeah, I just hate it whenever I show up and I don't get any cards and I just lose. <laughs> yeah, like, it happens. You just lose sometimes. And that is okay. Understand that you will hit that 30% of the time many times throughout your career. So all you can really do, and the way I kind of view games in general, is that whenever you go to play the game, all of your decisions are kind of already made by your preparation away from the table and the mindset you show up with, right? If you show up thinking perfectly clearly, not annoyed with life, not disgruntled, not mad, not worrying about nonsense, and you have studied more than your opponents, you will have an edge and you will make good plays. Simple as that. A lot of people, though, don't really know what good poker looks like. They don't know what good strategy is. And they show up and they are annoyed or tilted or frustrated or whatever. And that's going to result in them losing. I make a point to try to be as um, clear-minded as possible whenever I play poker and do anything that matters, to be fair. And I make a point to study a lot. And that's going to result in me using a better strategy than my opponents for the most part. Now, obviously not better than the absolute best players in the world, but better than most people I play against, right? And that's going to result in you having a win rate, and a positive win rate, right? The nice thing as well is that whenever you know how to play poker well, you're going to understand spots that are unavoidable. Someone asked me just yesterday, um, it was a standard spot. Somebody raised, he shoved ace-jack, the opponent called with twos and he lost. He's like, should I have just called pre-flop because I got called and I lost? Kind of tells me this player has not studied poker all that much because it was an obvious shove with the ace-jack for 10 big blinds or whatever it was. And it was an obvious call with the twos. But that player was um, unaware if it was a standard spot, right? And if you don't know what default poker strategy is, you're, you're going to end up second-guessing yourself a lot. But in a lot of tournaments you play, especially your bust-out hand when you're shallow stacked, it's going to be very, very routine. And you have to be cool with it. If you get it all in in a routine spot, such as life, also a lot of people think that they should be trying to play some strategy that avoids them getting it all in at all cost. But what inevitably happens is that results in them just blinding out. When you blind out, you're definitely not going to win. You may cash more often, but you're definitely not going to win. So anyway, understand you're going to bust most tournaments you play. Someone asked for cash game strategy. Hey, are you new here? Are you new here? For cash games, low stake. Give us advice, please. I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash poker coaching. Go there. I'm sure if you type in cash in the search bar, it'll bring up all sorts of videos. That's something like, how many videos do I have on YouTube? Can someone pull it up? It's like a thousand or something silly, right? Do you play craps at all for fun? No. What percentage of break is too high to be profitable? Depends on how bad your opponents are, right? In a cash game, you're aware when you're running bad, should you end the session? Uh, no, because the idea of I'm running bad now does not mean you're going to be running bad in the future. You see good runs and bad runs looking backwards. You do not see them looking forwards. There's no logic to I have lost five hands in a row, therefore I'm going to lose my next hand. It's not how math works. When you get short under 12 big blinds, what percentage... What percentage of hand ranges should be an easy shove in early, middle, or late position? Uh, Dig Dug and Kim, check out the Poker Coaching app. Please, 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 please. 
Please, please, please. Let me pull up the Poker Coaching app. I'll show you. Got to make sure I'm not showing you all my sensitive information over here. All right, let's see. Poker Coaching. We go over here to the tool section. Give me just a second. GTO tournament preflop charts. These are all available on your phone, by the way. I realize it's a little bit small here. Let me make it a little bit bigger. All right. What was the question? Which hands do you shove with if somebody raises or everybody folds to you? Well, first things first, select the number of big blinds you have. We have 12, and let's put us on the button. What should we do with 12 big blinds on the button? First thing you'll notice right off the bat is you should have an all-in range and a raising range. You should not just be shoving or folding. That is actually a big blunder a lot of people make. There have been a few apps out there that people try to make you pay for that gives you blatantly incorrect poker information, assuming you're trying to play anywhere near GTO poker. Um, for example, here, you see that we are playing on the button in the spot, 12 big blinds deep, about 38% of hands, right? If you shove or fold only, though, I don't know what the actual number is because I don't play that strategy, but you should probably play something like 30% of hands or 32% of hands. So by playing a better strategy, you get to play more hands profitably. So as you see, they fold you on the button. You should be shoving these hands in dark red, min raising these hands in light red. Very polarized strategy. Min raise all the best hands and call a jam. Men raise these weaker hands and fold to a jam, and then you open and shove all these hands in the middle. Common stuff. Uh, but the question is like, what if you have 10 big blinds? Well, your strategy should be different, right? You can't say, what do I do with a short stack when it folds to me? Because 10 big blinds is different than 12. And it's very different from 15, right? And it's going to be very different from eight. Once you get down to like nine big blinds or shorter, it's probably fine to use a shove or fold strategy from every spot besides a small blind. But that's that. Um, what do you do if we are on the button versus a raise from the cutoff? Well, here you go. You call the hands in green. Notice you still have a calling range, 12 big blinds deep. And you um, shove the hands in red. So you call green, shove red. Notice by flat calling aces, 12 big blinds deep, you get to flat call a few other speculative hands that flop pretty well. That said, this is a GTO strategy. You should often not use a GTO strategy against your opponents if they are playing poorly, as a lot of people do. Maybe you want to shove wider, right? If you are card dead and you think your opponent's raising too wide in the cutoff, I would definitely shove way wider than this. I would shove like any pair. Lots of these King X suited, Queen Nine suited. Like I'd be shoving all sorts of stuff if I thought I would have a lot more fold equity than normal. Um, notice if we're 10 big blinds deep, we're probably going to not do much calling at all anymore. Like right here, if you see a, a GTO strategy that looks like this where you call basically none, I would just probably not even slow play the aces here. But you see, 20 big blinds deep, you're gonna be using a very different strategy. It'll be more calling, right? As you're deeper, you get to call more often. And, and this is just like stuff you learn by studying, right? What if we're against under the gun raise? Well, obviously you're gonna be a little bit tighter and you're not gonna jam as much, right? Because now against under the gun, you are going to be running into premium hands more often, which means you in turn don't get to shove as often. Common stuff, right? You just have to make sure that you study. What changes should you employ against players who are using a heads-up display software? You should just play closer to GTO. Learn to play better. What's the best way to learn logic behind GTO strategy? This is the tough thing for a lot of people because it's easy to look at a GTO strategy and kind of realize what it's doing. But how do you replicate it? How do you actually know how to play reasonably well at the poker table? And the answer is... <laughs> You find somebody who's already learned how to explain it. I have that at pokercoaching.com. We have gigantic cash game and tournament masterclasses there where I explain how to play roughly the GTO strategy. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be a close approximation. And it's going to be way closer than what you're going to do if you're just guessing. But it does take a lot of effort to not only learn what the GTO strategy looks like, but to learn why the GTO strategy does what it does. Like right here, for example, cut off, you shove more then uh, if you're on the button against a cutoff raise, you go all in more often 20 big blinds deep than you would against under the gun raise. Why? We have to apply logic here, right? And this is a, a very easy one to figure out because under the gun has a stronger range. Duh, right? But some of the spots are a little bit convoluted. Like why are you bluffing queen high on some boards and king high on other boards when they're both over cards? We're not gonna get into that today, but stuff like that we explain, right? because you want to make sure you have an adequate number of bluffs. Obviously, you have to be able to balance your value bet to bluffing frequency for various bet sizes, and it's it's a lot. Poker is a tough game. I hate to break it to you. It's not an easy game. But um, it's very nice whenever you have someone who's already spent their life studying it, and they can easily explain it to you. But uh, yeah, 
it'll be much easier than trying to remember the GTO play. You can't remember the GTO play. I hate to break it to you. You're not a robot. I'm not a robot. So you develop implementable strategies, which is exactly what I teach at PokerHotion.com. And there are a few videos on this YouTube channel where I go through that. Look up um, when to continuation bet and how much whenever you're done with this show. That's like the, the basics of it. At what point is deal making a good idea? Mm, I don't really make good deals all that much. Good players don't take deals. <laughs> well, so look, there are definitely times to make deals. If you're making a deal, though, you may be screwed up to begin with because you're playing for money that is too big for you. But sometimes you do end up playing for money that's too big for you. Like, say, you final table the main event of the World Series of Poker and you're playing for a bazillion buy-ins, right? I mean, I guess, I guess you should probably make a deal in that spot. I wouldn't. <laughs> I definitely think if you care about money, you should be more inclined to make deals than if you don't. I've gotten to play heads up for $500,000 three times in my career. I've made zero deals. The tough thing is, is that when you're playing against somebody else who's also good, they're not going to want to give up anything. And I know with a pretty high degree of certainty that I care way less about money than most people. Therefore, if I don't care at all, and I'm just going to sit there and play good poker, and my opponent cares some, and they're going to try to play good poker, we're either flipping or I'm going to have a bit of an edge. And if you have a 1% or 2 or 3% edge on someone playing for half a million dollars, it's a decent amount of money going your direction. <sighs> How's the voting going? I don't know. They don't tell you. If you enjoy my show, if you think I have a poker personality, <laughs> head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote. I think that vote ends soon. I don't even know when it ends. I think in a day or two, something like that. I don't know when we're going to know who wins. I appreciate all of you giving me accolades, by the way. It's nice to know that people care. In the content creation space, and in most spaces, really, you don't, you don't necessarily get... Um, you don't get recognition all that much. And, you know, I'm in a nice spot where I don't, like, need the recognition or anything. I, I'm perfectly happy and content and fine in life. But it is nice to know that you all appreciate my work. And I, I appreciate the fact that you appreciate my work. And it lets me know that we're, we're, we're doing right. We actually won the award. I'll show you this thing full screen. Let's see. We won the award last time we had the awards. 2019. People's Choice for Poker Personality. That's a good-looking trophy, huh? Thank you all for giving it to me. I appreciate all of you. Anyway, we're trying to win it again. Maybe that's greedy. Mm. I don't know. I appreciate all of you. And whenever you are doing things to better a community or better the world, as I, I really am trying to have a positive impact on all of your lives here, it is your duty, to some extent, to get your word out there. I know a lot of people have a negative view on promoting things. I mean, in, in the artist world, a lot of artists are like very, very anti-make money and get attention. But you have to realize, whenever you get attention, you can use that to spread whatever your message is to a broader audience. And if you think you're doing good things and adding value to the world and building up a community and helping others... It is not, it makes no sense to not try to spread your word and to help others. I like helping others. So anyway, I appreciate all of you. That's what, what that amounts to. You think I think I deserve poker personality of the year? Head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote. All right. Do you recommend playing an exploitative strategy? Yeah, of course. Why would you not try to take advantage of what your opponents are doing wrong? You should always take advantage of what your opponents are doing wrong. You're having trouble understanding GTO bet sizes. John Philippe, I will say that in general, it is hard to pick the right bet size every time. It is difficult. It is difficult to find the right bet size. Range advantage, nut advantage, how well your opponent connects with the board, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is, uh, it's all baked into it. It is a lot. And the nice thing though, about at least figuring out if you should be betting or checking most of the time, is that as long as you're putting in some money, it's not going to be the perfect GTO play, but it's also not going to be like the worst option, right? And I don't think this has been proven, but it seems common sense that if you pick the first or second best play every time, as I can do a lot of the time and a lot of my students can do a lot of the time, you're not going to be the perfect GTO player, but you're going to be pretty close. And if you're pretty close, you're going to be way better than the vast majority of people you play with. 
What's the difference between promoting and shilling? Well, they're different words to some extent. I think um, shill has a bit of a negative connotation because whenever you're shilling for something, you know that you're promoting something that's bad for people, I think. That's my, my definition of it. Obviously, my definition is certainly prone to be incorrect. I have not looked it up in the dictionary. You got to realize that whenever you have an audience, you can do whatever you want with your audience, right? A lot of people do not have clear ideas of what they're even trying to accomplish. I mean, a long time ago, I'll tell you, it was like a dream for anyone to be sponsored by a poker site. That was the dream because that means you'd made it. But that dream has been dead for a long time. Hate to break it to you. Um, a long time ago, if you got a deal from a poker site, you'd be getting paid $100,000 a year. Now, you get a deal from a poker site, you're getting paid uh, 500 bucks a month or something, which is, hate to break it to you, not a lot of money. And now you have to worry about the poker site defrauding the players, which is clearly not good. We've seen this happen a few times where people who are like well-respected poker players stuck around promoting a site that was paying them some amount of money, and the site went down or cheated players or whatever, and it looks really, really bad on you. Uh, a long time ago, that was at least less of a concern, even though it's still probably a live thought. It had not happened multiple times in the past already, right? Um, it's a little bit forgivable whenever something happens the first time. Whenever something happens six or eight times, you have to be a little bit more careful. But a lot of people don't quite realize what they're doing. And I don't necessarily know why that is. Maybe their, their vision is clouded. But you can do things to, I mean, for example, you can uh, promote all sorts of stuff to your to your followers. You can do whatever you want, right? And there's nothing wrong with doing that. You just have to realize that you're going to attract like-minded people at the end of the day. And um, I try to attract people who work hard to improve each other, improve the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we have here. I mean, if you look at a, a lot of um, a lot of people's channels, their their comments are filled with nonsense, right? Nonsense, hatred, lies, et cetera. And we have like basically none of that here, which is good means I've done a good job of attracting people who are reasonable humans who are working hard to improve themselves and each other. And that's exactly what we're going for. Everyone is not for everyone. It's important to be aware of. Everyone is not for everyone, and that is okay. Game Freaker says, I've helped you win five figures this year. Five figures already? That'd be good. Five figures last year? Still pretty good. Good job, good work. And Ryan said you signed up. I appreciate it. Hope you learn a ton. Any advice on bankroll management? Yeah, go to pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. There it is. Monty says, your favorite YouTube channel, where I, I appreciate it. When is it too soon to start thinking about ICM? ICM comes into play before you get in the money. So uh, if there's 30 people left and there are 1,000 people that started, you should have been well concerned with ICM before then. Um, ICM, ICM is the independent chip model. And it essentially makes you play a different strategy when there are payout increases looming. And there are payout increases looming at all points in a tournament once you get in the money and before you get in the money. Now, I will say the biggest payout jump for a long time is the first payout jump once you get in the money. And a lot of tournaments, let's take this one, for example, with 1,000 players, maybe 150 people get in the money, and then there's no real payout increase between 1,000th and, I don't know, 300th or 200th, right? So ICM starts to not matter all that much when you're down to you know, 700 people. But if there is a payout jump coming up where let's say, I don't know, 500th place gets $1,000 and 500 first place gets $600 or $800 or $900, whatever. It's like a little increase. You should probably be a little bit tighter in those scenarios. Maybe you should play a little bit more slowly to get that payout jump. If you collect a lot of these free payout jumps that really are pretty free to collect, um, you'll probably win more money than if you don't. I mean, we see this happening all the time in online tournaments specifically, and live tournaments as well, I guess, in, in various spots where there are payouts, where if you just play a little slowly at a particular point in time, you can let somebody else bust before you, and then you bust, and then you get the payout jump. Obviously, the idea of stalling in poker is super lame, but if the rules incentivize you to do something, and you care about winning at the game, or in poker, winning at money, you are incentivized to play within the rules, as they are laid out to maximize your win rates. I had a video uh, with Faraz Jaka recently on YouTube and we were kind of laughing at the fact that he stalled and got a payout increase or something. And someone was very annoyed in the chat box and said, we're part of the problem because we stalled in this scenario. And um, the, the problem is the design of the game. The problem is not with the players. It's very important to realize. 
if the rule incentivizes the players to do something, the players would be dumb to not do it or just not care about money or not care about winning. But if you care about winning, you're incentivized to do that thing, right? So in all games, they need to be tinkered with. The rules need to be adjusted a little bit. And I mean, if you take a game like Magic the Gathering, the players are incentivized to play the best deck and the best cards and win as much as they possibly can. Just like in poker, you're incentivized to win as much as you can. And if the game designer screwed up something, they try to fix it. In Magic, they ban cards. In poker, maybe whenever you get kind of near the bubble, everybody should have a five-second shot clock or a 10-second shot clock. You know? Sure. Whatever. Change the rules. If you do not like the rules of the game, you don't have to play. And if the rules of the game are universally thought to be bad, change the rules. If you look at the high stakes game, they all have shot clocks now. Now, if they give you a bunch of time banks, you're allowed to burn your time banks. I mean, a good example of this is say you know, let's say you have three minutes worth of time banks. You know if you give away all of your time banks, you'll get in the money or you get a payout jump or whatever. Give them away. If you're not going to need them later, I mean, that's the penalty. The penalty is that you don't get your time banks anymore later in the tournament. But it is a-okay to burn all of your time banks. That's, that's part of the game. That's what the rules incentivize. Anyway, that's that. Found me here on Twitch. Hello, hello. Okay, 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 okay. Do I have a video se series teaching about leaks and strengths? I don't really think about poker like this so much. I think this is kind of a simplistic way to view the game. Um, there are plenty of, there certainly can make a list of things people do wrong and things people do right. But I think the way, at least I and most people go about learning games is by developing strategies. Not, um, you know, don't call when they check raise you on the river. Because sometimes you should, right? I do have a fundamentals course. Check it out, pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. Why wouldn't you take the opportunity to ladder up? Well, that's exactly it, right? People think that there is etiquette in poker. And there there is etiquette in poker. Like, um, for example, it's generally frowned upon when you slow roll someone. I personally don't slow roll anyone, but I don't hold it against anybody who does. You may say, why not? Doesn't it make you a jerk? And I think the answer is no. Is there a rule that says you must table your hand at the showdown immediately? I don't think there is. I think most casinos have no rule that says you must table your hand immediately. Should you get a penalty if you misread your hand and you don't know, know you have the nuts? Like, I don't know. I don't know, right? So I'm not saying to go around slow rolling people. But at the same time, it's not a line, but is it uh, against the rules? And the answer is no, right? I remember hearing about in chess, um, people would be playing chess and they would, uh, this one guy, I forget who it was, would like tap on the table randomly in like random increments or like kick the ground and it would like bother the opponent. Is that against the rules to tap the table? I don't know. If it's not, then uh, kind of incentivized to do it. It doesn't make you a nice person necessarily, but you got to realize we are playing a game. And in games, assuming you are a type of person who's trying to win, maybe you're supposed to. But at the same time, I realize I'm not trying to win as much money as I possibly can from poker. I'm not. I'm not. And that's okay. Most people are not. You can do all sorts of things that are allowed, but still make you a jerk. Do you ever do play and explains? Sometimes, not so much though. Do you feel poker is harder than chess? Um, I don't know. Probably not. Chess is a chess and poker are very different games. I'm not a chess master by any means, so I'm not even going to talk about it. You want a new premium poker coaching membership? Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. Froz was talking about stalling to a min cash. Totally makes sense. I mean, it does make sense. It's unfortunate that stalling is a part of the game, but that's what the rules incentivize. Problem with chess is that you usually play with people your level. Do you? I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, obviously, like... They have tournaments where people are roughly ranked the same. But, I mean, if you, if I was to, like, go to a random tournament, I don't know if they're going to necessarily try to match me with people that are that are that close. Just checking in to give your love for the channel. Where Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I love all of you being here. I appreciate all of you being here with me. 
I understand that's how tournaments... I understand that tournaments go by rating, but at the same time, you inevitably play with people who are not the same skill level as you, right? Like, whenever you get to the finals, you're playing against whoever else made it to the finals. Sometimes they're better than you, sometimes they're worse than you, right? In football, you run down the clock. You do. You do. I love how this show inevitably goes to either people trying to steal your money or various angles people make in the game. What is what is hook up with all of you that you think this is such a big such, these are such big topics? You do in most tournaments if you play cash, not always. I don't know what's talking about here. Anyway, yeah, coffee time, brain fuel time, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that's gonna be it for today. We've gone for about an hour. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, do me a favor and click the like and subscribe button. Realize that you're going to run poorly sometimes, and that is A-OK. -okay. Stay sane, study a lot away from the table, probably more than you do, and work hard. Skill levels in poker are much wider than in chess. Yeah, presumably. I mean, again, I, I don't know. I don't know because I'm not a one of the best chess players in the world. I, I don't know how big of an edge the number one chess player in the world has over the number two chess player in the world. But I kind of think the number one poker player in the world does not have much of an edge at all over the number two poker player in the world. But I think in chess they may actually have a pretty big edge. I don't know about that. That's me for today. Enjoy yourselves. I think selling a tough link is broken. Thank you. We'll try to fix it. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great week. It's Monday. Make the most of your life. My, my uh, homework for all of you. Find a way to add value and help others. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. All we can do is our best. Let's have a great week.